Hello world, Sir Lawrence NZ here and welcome back to the map overview series where today we're going to take an in-depth look into the African Kingdom's map, Kilimanjaro. Kilimanjaro is an extremely open and aggressive map which often has a dramatic shortage of woodlands close to the town centre. This forces players onto the Kilimanjaro mountain itself where the majority of the wood is located, coming in small to medium patches similar to Serengeti. This leads me onto the standard resources you can expect to find and where to find them on Kilimanjaro, along with visual comparisons to Arabia shown in blue, but before we do that, here's a quick cheat sheet with all the spawn totals you'll need to know. Your four and only goats spawn between six and nine tiles from the middle of the town centre, with your six pack of ostriches or zebra spawning between 12 and 16 tiles. Your four orange bushes spawn 11 to 13 tiles away, and your single elephant between 12 and 15 tiles away. For your main golden stone, both contain four mines each with the gold spawning between 7 and 12 tiles away, with the stones spawning between 7 and 11 tiles. The secondary golden stones both contain three mines each and can be found between 10 and 16 tiles away. Extra golden stones spawn under the same criteria as Serengeti, where they spawn at least 30 tiles away from players and 45 tiles away from the same extra resource types, with two to three of each spawning per player. For wood, Roughly two thirds of it spawn on the Kilimanjaro mountain itself, with the other thirds spawning around the mountain and the surrounding savannas. In terms of straggler trees, you get five 150 wood acacia trees between four and eight tiles away from the town centre. Besides that, you're almost entirely dependent on randomly generated wood lines, which in a few exceptional cases, can well leave you in this sort of position. Not ideal in the slightest. Moving on to terrain, there's a rather interesting observation I've made on Kilimanjaro's central woodlines, being that they're largely dependent on map size, most notably on the 6-8 to eight player maps where the woodlines are absolutely gigantic compared to their smaller map counterparts. Another somewhat related aspect to this mechanic is that the mountain spawns with a proportionally larger peak on 6 and 8 player maps that push many of the trees that would have spawned on the peak to spawn along the mountain slopes where they intersect with one another. These larger woodlines mainly affect the game by creating choke points around the mountain peak that can be walled from in the castleage to secure your side, whilst providing a solid long-term wood solution. Taking a step away from the mountain for now, there's a few other notable terrain features on Kilimanjaro, one of which is the randomly generated ponds that spawn in the surrounding savannas. These ponds often have quicksand spawning around them, which on occasion end up mostly replacing the entire pond. The difference between quicksand and normal terrain is that quicksand doesn't allow building foundations to be laid, occasionally leading to an awkward wall off. Also, there are no changes in elevation on the savannas, meaning that any fights taken there are on a level playing field. This also affects the viability of booming, as Kilimanjaro, unlike Serengeti, has large flat areas with wood and gold often nearby. The quicksand simply isn't abundant enough on Kilimanjaro to hinder good town centre placements, making a degree of booming legitimately viable. Oh, and you can totally exploit Malay fish traps in Harbour's late game. Bringing things back to the mountain, a lot of the aggressive plays made on Kilimanjaro during 1vs 1s and 2vs 2s are made pushing down the hill onto your opponent. On the contrary, 3vs 3s and 4vs 4s have more circular player positions, which result in battles taking place on the level savannas. With both these angles of attack present, it's also important to consider the varying availability of wood in the centre, and how potential choke points can be utilised to your advantage. On a side note, if you find yourself in the position of running your archers away from enemy knights, you can take advantage of the woodline gaps on the mountain to reduce surface area and provide hill bonus to your archers. Just be careful not to pull it out. Before we move on to build order adjustments, I'd like to touch on the topic of laming. Kilimanjaro has a single elephant that spawns slightly closer than on Serengeti, where the enemy can potentially deny the lame whilst heavily injuring or killing your scout in the process made even worse by the elephant attack animation being shorter than standard boars. There is one benefit to taking all these risks though. If you're successful, 
you've just crippled your opponent's food economy where they already lacked over 200 natural food compared to Arabia. As a result, they might be forced to start dropping farms between the 8 and 10 minute mark instead of at the 12 minute mark. For reference, Arabia forces you to do the same when your berry villagers finish around the 14 to 15 minute mark. This makes it significantly harder to maintain or develop your food economy whilst creating a second archery range for example. Moving on to build order adjustments. Kilimanjaro requires that you prioritise things a little bit differently. Because of there only being a single elephant, three less orange bushes and four less goats than standard, you're largely reliant on the six ostriches or zebra to make up the difference and that hugely impacts your scouting. Therefore, Luring your ostriches or zebra after the second goat is preferable, so that you have more time to scout your opponent before the feudal age. When you choose to slot in your elephant is up to you however and is largely dependent on your situation. Another aspect to cover is the lower standard food count. As previously mentioned, your orange bushes will run out earlier, roughly at the 12 minute mark, which is around the time you consider adding a second range following men at arms. Therefore, adding in a few farms before prioritising the range is heavily recommended to avoid idle time. Lastly, you can prioritise hunt under the town centre to an extent over berries to help minimise the decay of your already tight natural resources. Anyways, let's take a look into the meta strategies and civilization choices I'm expecting to develop on Kilimanjaro. In terms of early game strategies, we need to consider the openness of the map along with the reduced natural food sources, which leads me to believe that heavy scout rushes are going to be less viable on Kilimanjaro. So strategies like Man at Arms can deal even better with scouts despite only slightly delaying their second archery range following the Man at Arms. That said, the surrounding savannas are so open that there's still a great case for pocket scouts in team games where teams can exploit their military advantages by forcing their opponents into taking unfavourable engagements to protect their economies. To defend on Kilimanjaro, the difficulty of walling introduced by patchy tree lines and quicksand makes defending with towers a strong consideration when falling behind, taking into account the closer stone mines. With these strategies outlined, here's my rankings for the top 1 vs 1 civilizations on Kilimanjaro. Mayans, Indians, Ethiopians, Aztecs, Mongols, Huns, Slavs, Burmese, Malians, and Malay. When it comes to team games on Kilimanjaro, there's a few civilizations that don't quite individually fit to the map style, while still being excellent choices, such as the Magyars, Berbers, Britons, Incas, Persians, Chinese, and Spanish. Besides that, some of the remaining civilizations may be good counterpicks, but don't have enough to really set them apart from the rest on Kilimanjaro. Finally, as is the case with a lot of open map team games, it's important to focus down priority players to counter your opponent's power spikes where possible. Kilimanjaro makes this more effective than usual with its patchy woodlines, quicksand prone lakes and vast open spaces. This also makes raiding an extremely difficult prospect to deal with. In summary, Kilimanjaro is yet another open map that incentivizes players to duke it out in the early game with tighter resources. It does this while preserving opportunities to boom and carry out into the late game where raiding and team play should dominate with the appropriate civilizations. The map being centered by the large Kilimanjaro mountain and level plains down below forces its players inwards to obtain wood and gain an excellent foothold to push down into their opponents for the final blow. But that just about does it for me. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing and leaving me a comment down below. I'd also like to thank JRed for sharing my last map overview on Serengeti, which you can find here, along with my latest video here. Cheers, and thanks for watching. Wait a minute. I screwed up the schedule. This was meant to come out next year. Oh well.